My name is Mahesh Misra. I'm a principal product manager with AWS Lake Formation. With me, I have a customer, Jerry Moses, who comes from the Amazon.com side, who uh, owns the Data Lake uh, platform for Amazon.com. We also have a big data architect from AWS Lake Formation team, Arthur Srinivasan, presenting to you today how to curate data at scale. Let's review the agenda for today. Uh, we have um, what is data curation uh, as first topic. We'll talk about what we mean by that, how, how we look at it, how, how to think about it, and why it is at an enterprise scale, why it is so hard, right? And, and probably provide some best practices around how to think about it the right way in AWS way. Then Jerry will talk about their journey using AWS technology and uh, um, and processes uh, to, to curate data at scale. And um, Arthi will show some cool demo about how AWS managed services can make it easy for you to manage data. So before we dive in, let's look at some interesting numbers. This is a survey data that was published last year from HVR, the Harvard Business Review, which says more than 90% of the enterprise customers, Fortune 1000 customers, or Fortune 1000 companies, are investing in data modernization. And their data modernization practices are growing each year. But the same set of companies, when they surveyed, do they really believe that they're getting more data-driven? They found that less than 25% of those companies believe that they're data-driven. Now, there is a key question here. That is, where is the disparity here? Like, why it is too hard for customers who are investing in data, the data volumes are growing, the data infrastructure costs are growing, but they're not becoming data-driven. So, before we go and then talk about those problems, challenges that they have, and talk about how to solve it, let's understand what this term called uh, data curation is. The way I define data curation, it's a five-stage process that is intended to break three types of silos. One is data silo, the other one is system silo, the third one is people silo. The five-stage processes start with identifying your source systems, and integrating and centralizing them at one place, like a data lake or a data warehouse. And then you govern them, define guardrails, security controls around them, and share it with them, with your users. And now think about this. Why, when you look at identify your sources and integrate them, those are essentially breaking down the data silos, because your source systems are discrete, and you are, you are integrating them at one place, you are breaking down the system files. Centralizing them at one place is, what that means is you, you are creating standardized storage, standardized way to access the data, you are breaking down the, the data silo. Then, then the last and most uh, important thing is you are connecting your data with your people through governance and data sharing capabilities. So you are breaking down your people and knowledge silo. So when you can achieve all these five things, you say you are really curating data at scale. Why so many, so many companies are struggling to curate data at scale today? The first challenge that we see is, first of all, their source system, the point of data generation, the OLTP systems, they are siloed. Customers today have their data in different size solutions like ERPs with CRNs. They have data in different micro, microservices, mobile and web applications. And then when they want to do analysis, they want those data together. It's very hard when your data is sitting in multiple different systems because they, they support different storage layer, different interfaces, different security model, bunch of limitations there. Then you might be thinking, oh, there is something known as ETL. We have been doing that for years. We can do it, right? ETL is hard, too. 
So when you are doing data integration, first of all, when your sources are so discrete, you need to be able to connect to those data sources to get the data out. You need to understand their authentication, authorization model, create right kind of connections and models to operate against the data in the source system. Then you need to build custom ETL pipelines, which are like a bunch of scripts that you write, or you, if you have a UI-based UI tool, you should be able to create um, you know, ETL pipelines using those tools. And guess what? After that, your problem is not solved because as your ETL jobs fail, you need to recover them from failure. You need to monitor them. And as your data volume is growing, you are, you are going to do a lot of undifferentiated heavy lifting to be able to you know, scale your infrastructure in a way that it will support your growing data volume. Say you did all that. Life moves on. How do you connect your data with your people? Governance is hard, too. When you start your governance journey, the way I describe, define governance, it is, it is like infusing trust in data and defining guardrails and controls around data so that you set your users free to do data-driven analysis. And when you start your uh, data governance journey, essentially, the first thing that you want to do is know what exists. What data do I have and what controls do I need? That means you need to curate a lot of metadata. Your source systems are growing. Your data, data, data sets are growing. You have a third problem. Your metadata is growing, too. And when your metadata is growing, you end up having you know, a massive amount of metadata if you want to collect all kinds of metadata. For example, if you want to store schema definition of your, of your data sets, you want to store uh, data types, you want to store things like you know, data profile, you want to classify your data sets, you want to define ontologies, you want to build data products on top of it. These are harder problems. You, you end up having in a place where you will spend multiple months, multiple teams of engineering effort to be able to curate data at that scale. So that's your problem. Um, when your metadata is broken, everything around it is also broken. You, you create wrong policies. You don't know which one is your PII data, so definitely your policies are wrong. So you, your guardrails depend on your metadata. So data governance itself e itself is a difficult uh, challenge for customers. Now look at, you know all these problems. You are, you are facing those problems every day. Now look at how to think about it the right way. So when you start your data curation journey, the first thing that I tell all my customers is, hey, think long term, work backwards from that. So when you think long term, the first choice that you make is the right technology choice and the right technology partner like AWS. AWS will give you managed capabilities for metadata harvesting, for data classification, for data quality checks, for ETL, for, uh, for things like data cataloging, and multiple different suite of products that are available to you. So if, for, for example, a simp let's take the example of Glue. Glue itself is going to give you all ETL capability ETL data quality, which um, uh, data quality tools, which uh, Aarti is going to present later today. Uh, you have sensitive data detection, which, so that you can automatically detect and uh, get your sensitive data and register that in a catalog. So first thing, you made a technology choice, right? You, you chose your partner, and then you have all the automation tools that are available readily from your partner to automate your data discovery and metadata management. You are not doing it anymore manually. Earlier today, we announced Gen AI metadata harvesting on data zone. So you can build all these capabilities, you can use all these capabilities to be able to automate your data discovery and metadata management. Then second important thing, you, you have now you know, metadata harvesting, but you need to store it somewhere so your customers can see them, right? So 
catalog all your data assets, including your metadata, including your data, including everything around it, the ontologies, create business models on top of it, and catalog them at one single place. And, and because your metadata is clean, it's coming through automated processes, your entitlements will be clean. Use a centralized service like Lake Formation or Data Zone to be able to define those entitlements and share data, set your users free, and periodically audit them so that you understand what is the health of your architecture, how, how your governance is working, what data is being used, what data is being not, what policies exist, which are stale, and you keep you know, improving your system eventually. Okay, you made the technology choice, but now the second choice that you want to make you choose the right architecture. I always say, take a long-term view, but you cannot get to the long-term view if you don't take the first step. The first step is, you choose the right architecture which is simple and evolve from there. If you are starting now, as a, as a first, if your data journey is starting now, you start with a very simple architecture, one single data catalog, one single account, all data registered there, and you know, your, your customers can consume, your employees can consume from the same data catalog. And then evolve it, federate that. You have one, hub, one central account where all your data sits, then, then your consumers can be separated in different accounts. And if you want to go, if you are mature enough as a, as a data team, you have, de you have fully decentralized practices, go for data mess. You orient your data, uh, data sets as data products, and then have peer-to-peer -peer data sharing. You chose your, you made a decision, technology decision. You chose an architecture. Will that solve all the problems? Didn't we say in the beginning that 90% of the companies are spending in technology, data lake modernization, but not, they are not becoming data-driven. So what are we missing here? We are missing the people aspect of it. So, so you need to invest in your people. The way to think about this is don't align your teams based on what they do. This is my data engineering team, wrong. This is my business intelligence team, wrong. This is my customer data ownership team. That's right. They take care of their, take, take care of their consumers, they, they build it, they maintain it, they take decisions independently and they collaborate among themselves to give the right data product and data experience to the consumers who are going to use the data at scale. With this, I'm going to invite Jerry, um, who is from Amazon.com, a valued customer, to come on the stage and talk about their journey of data curation. Thank you. Hello, everyone. So some say data is gold, but only if you can find it, you can hold on to it, and you can keep it flowing in. It's all very similar. Protecting data is more than just preventing bad actors from getting at it. It's also about doing it in a way that doesn't hamstring your business, and also in a way that your customers trust you that you're doing the right thing and continue doing business with you. What I want to talk to you today is the journey of the Amazon store devices and other business in creating a, 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 a program and process for protecting our data and hopefully you can learn a little bit from our journey. So first, a little bit about us. I said we are the Amazon store data and other business, think Amazon.com data lake. That's what we are. Um, we have a very large amount of data. I put, some, I put some numbers on the slide. But the thing about it is the sheer volume of data, the number of data sets, and the number of teams is really forcing us to think about doing this, having automated processes and scalable processes for governance, manual just will not cut it with this particular scale. 
our government's problem areas are very similar to what you saw earlier. Um, we have this entire list. Each one of these things is probably one of these presentations unto itself. Today, I'm going to talk to you about fine grain access control and a little bit about consumption in multiple query engines. So first, in order to explain the problem, I want to talk to you a little bit about how we were doing things. So compliance and protecting data is just, it's not optional. You have to find a way to do it. And so in a world where there were no fine grain access controls, there was full data access, we had to do something. And so what data set owners were doing is if we had to basically publish a slice of data, perhaps only redacting certain rows, maybe certain rows represent a partner and they're sensitive, they would do something like my table policy one. If the, the table you know, contain sensitive columns, maybe child data, maybe PII, we do something like policy two. What we've now done is created three copies of the table and as long also processes that actually need to run and keep each of these tables in sync. So now we have operational overhead, we have an additional storage cost. Then on the other side, our, custom, our consumers also want to, we're making copies of data to use um, AWS Compute. Redshift was probably the biggest. It's 90% of our you know, compute capacity. And for every Redshift local cluster, we had to make another local copy. And so we had to actually build a process, we modeled it as a subscription, that would synchronize these tables up. And for our popular data sets, that's two to 600 copies of a data set. And so now this whole process is ballooning out. So we've got all this redundant storage. And the biggest concern is how do we know like we're doing the right permissions? We have all the right permissions and we have the right retention policies and all of these copies. And most importantly, how do we audit this? So auditing now is super complex. It's not one thing. It's now potentially 603 things. And so we need to think of a better way. And so that better way is what we're calling fine grain access controls. And I'm gonna to talk to you a little bit about the two key AWS technologies that we used. I'm gonna dig into that a little bit about what we did and some of our, the things that we discovered along the way. And hopefully that's where the learnings from this are gonna come from. So the first key technology is AWS Lake Formation. AWS Lake Formation provides the fine grain access controls. With that, there's Glue Catalog Federation. And so you heard the talk earlier, metadata gets big. We didn't want to have to do a big migration project to move all of our data into the Glue Catalog and then change all of our tooling to work with Glue. So instead, we use catalog federation that sort of prevents all this. I'll explain how it works in a second. And the second piece we use is Amazon Data Share integrated with Lake Formation. So the first step sort of gives us all of the Glue query engines, so Athena, EMR, Glue ETL. And then to bring the Ledshift piece in, we needed to do the data share. And I'll talk a little bit about this. So how did we achieve the first piece? This is a highly, highly simplified diagram of a really complex system. And what I really show you here is just our integration points. With um, glue here is what provides the, the schema to query engines and also lake formation for implementing fine grain access controls. We didn't want to copy data, so we set up a federation service. And what that does is essentially Glue delegates API calls to our service, and our service essentially provides all the data that's required for that API. We get to keep our catalog, we get to keep our business processes, and then everything works. Lake Formation is providing the fine grain access control. So it has a data cell filter, which is a data construct which defines the rows and columns a user has access to, and then there are grants on the data cell filter. We have a permission service which sits at the end of our permissions workflow, which basically provisions the data cell filter and the grant. All of this lives in central account. You're hearing about the architecture. Is this going to be multiple account or single account? 
Well, the core data catalog sits in a single account. We call it Andy's, that's our brand. But we have thousands of teams. All of them have their own customer accounts. And so we have to have a way of actually you know, supporting you know, thousands and tens of thousands across account use cases. And that's what resource linking is. And what we essentially do is we create a link between a customer's glue catalog, our glue catalog, and at query time, the engine basically follows the resource link, gets the metadata, which is essentially brokered by our data, our federation engine, then contacts late formation, gets the authorized rows and columns, and then executes the query effectively. And so those are the integration points. And so that's the, like the raw mechanics for how to make it work. But there's more to the story. So there, this is where we're getting a little bit into our workflows. So the first persona is essentially a data set owner. And we, with fine grained access control, we introduced the concept of tagging. So how do you know what policies are associated with what rows and columns? And so a data set owner has to associate a tag with a row or a column. With a row, we define as a row classifier, so that's a SQL expression. Or they can associate it with an attribute. So that's that one link. And then tags are also associated with what we call a data policy. And the data policy essentially represents the enforcement as well as the permissions workflow that goes with it. And so with all of this together, with all of this mapping, we can now, we actually now know what permissions UX to present when someone's requesting permissions for this table. And our services know how to provision a data cell filter when a request is approved. What I describe here is a mechanism, and this is just a technology mechanism. The act of tagging is a whole problem area unto itself, which many people are, are talking about today. How do you go about finding the right tags for the right attributes at scale? And that's where a number of these processes are. There are AI models, are there simple tools? We started with simple tools and manual processes, but ultimately, there's, this is an area alone that requires much more development. So switching over to the consumer side. So the first thing we want to talk about is essentially the permissions workflow. And we had one before. And it was find the table, provide the identity, and request permission, full table access, and when it comes in, you can go. Here things are a little bit different with fine grained access controls and that we're not giving full table access. Um, we thought, we agonized over this UX for a very, very long time. We were thinking about where were we gonna do a column picker, where were we gonna allow people to put their own row classifiers into it, and we said, in the end we decided that's all too complex, at least for starting out. So we went with the idea of just naming our data access policy. So remember the slide before where we associated a table with a policy, the policy has a name. And so what you see here is the default policy, which is basically everything that's not associated with a sensitive policy, um, a data access policy. As we layer on more, and there'll be a region one later, you can actually see that this data set will have two policies associated with it. But this, the trick is we name them, and that provides the simplifications we'll get to later. The last part we need to set up is the cross-account permissions management. We had the concept of subscription before. This is how we set up our synchronization to Redshift. So we extended this to the glue concepts. And so rather than setting up a Redshift synchronizer, we set up the resource link. So create the link, grant all the cross-account permissions, all that's done for you, you don't mess it up. And this is a really easy step to mess up manually. So that's all well and good, but this particular mechanism does a lot more. By having a subscription, we can do things for, you, for, use, for consumers on their behalf, such as if a version changes, can we do an orchestrated update or like a schema changes or a permissions change. So we can actually now control that rather than chaos ensuing when something changes. With subscriptions, we also know who to talk to if something's gonna change. So once we had all of this, these pieces together, in essence, we have fine-grained access controls for glue-based services, so Athena, EMR, 
SageMaker, Glue ETL, that's all working. With all this great stuff, there's some technical challenges, and I'm going to go through them quickly. So the first one is sort of non-intuitive, and this is one we were like, no, we don't really need to worry about this problem, but we did. And the problem we have here is there are three different components in the system that have different views of your metadata. And the example I'm showing is data type. So we have our internal catalog, we have glue, and then we have files created by our tooling. And they all have their own slightly different nuance of what a, the individual data types are. And so we spend a lot of time you know, basically building this list of all the permutations. And it turned out it wasn't, wasn't that big. But what this table helped us do is proactively identify where are things going to break or where are we going to have an issue where a performance feature isn't going to be used. And so this really actually helped us de-risk the program early and turn it into more of a proactive, we know what we have to do, rather than reactive, peel the onion. This next area. Performance alone is a huge discussion, and so I'm going to talk about one of the features, but this is the thing that users were, this is the single biggest thing that users were terrified of when we talked fine-grained access controls. What's going to happen to performance? And it's probably not going to be as good as it was when you had like all this direct access. So the first feature we went after, which was a glue feature, is called predicate pushdown. And what we wanted to make sure is our fine grained access control features work with this. And the way this feature works, imagine a table, my table, you have three partitions, and the partitions all have files associated with them. And what happens with this feature is if uh, you pass a predicate into the engine that's sort of aligned with the partition key, the engine only has to read the partitions that are associated, or the files that are associated with that partition. Example one, we only have to read files one through n. If you look at example two, we don't have that match, and now the engine has to read all of the, essentially all of the files. The takeaway here is when you're planning your fine-grained access controls, you need to think about the performance features of the query engines and make them line up. You know, are your fine-grained access controls aligned around keys? Do the data, data types that you've chosen for these um, work are actually supported by the AWS services that um, implement this functionality. This again, one problem. There's like a, an exhaustive list of things we did with Glue and also with later on with, um, with Redshift to actually achieve the performance results we got. This, if you're doing a project like this, this is like an area to focus on. The second area is one that takes people by surprise. It's called permissions debugging. So if all of you have been in the governance space, You've probably seen this problem before. A bunch of people in a room, um, one group's presenting, they're showing the slide like the one on the left, and it's showing this metric is flat. Someone else in the room stands up and goes, no, it's not. I reviewed this yesterday, and this metric is actually increasing period over period. So what happens is, in conclusive meeting, people have to take a break. They go out, and they do the traditional governance process of, all right, do we have the same metric definition? Yes. Are we pulling data from the same place? Yes. Okay. What's wrong? And what you can see at the bottom is what's really happening is under the covers, an additional predicate is getting added to the slide on the left. And unbeknownst to them, their data is actually different than the one on the right. So how do you tease this out? And so we came to, and again, going back to our scale problem, we actually had to have a mechanism of actually, you know, produce, showing, being able to make this self-service. And so we created this process called permissions debugging. And so you can find your data set and say, what are my effective permissions now? Or what are the effective permissions for um, identity Z? And what it does is it actually shows you the names of the policies. And here you can see that there are two. And you can see here that I only have access to the default policy and that there's another one sitting there. The reason we went with this approach rather than showing essentially the raw SQL is this is easier to understand for business users. And there isn't so much a concern of like the raw SQL potentially showing sensitive data. 
Here we're showing the name of a policy. This is also actionable. I can look at this and go, I don't have access to region one, and from here I can just request permission. If I have a business case, I get permission and this is all resolved. So this was a big area, and this one we feel that it, we're, as, we're starting, as we're continuing our journey is gonna become a big user education issue. Having a way of doing this without you or your team who are building this out, being in the middle and answering this question is critical. Last piece, Amazon Redshift Data Share. So this is again, I just showing the change to our integration points. And so you can see on the right, we basically have a set of clusters we call producer clusters, which are owned by um, our own team. And we still have our Redshift synchronizer, but instead of copying 200 or 400 or 600 copies of data into Redshift, we copy it once. And all of this sort of lives and manages in our Andy's account. Similar to what I showed you with Glue, we have thousands of clusters. They all exist in different AWS accounts. And so we again use our subscription mechanism to set up a Redshift data share, that's a feature of Redshift, create a resource link, and then the query flow is very similar. The consumer cluster, the one reaches out to the producer cluster, gets the metadata to execute the query, then contacts lake formation, figures out what the row and column level constraints are, and then successfully executes the query, providing the consumer only with the data that they're ac they have access to. So again, with this particular solution, we've now eliminated the redundant copies of um, Redshift data from N to one, and we're still using our essentially our single centralized permission store so we don't have permissions all over the place. So let's talk about our results. So 99% of our data sets are enabled for this infrastructure. What about the other 1%? Well, it's actually less than 1%. This is all, these are all the long pole items that were related to um, that type slide that I showed you earlier. Instead of having like an unknown, well, we have 2,000 data sets and we're trying to figure out what's wrong with them, we actually have a plan. We know what data sets exist, they have a problem, and we know what needs to be done. It's a matter of finishing up the data migrations. We expect to have that done by the end of the year. But it's our proactive planning that allowed us to get there. The second aspect is the number of data sets which are exclusively on this infrastructure. The issue, the way we rolled this out is we basically said, we will allow consumers to use the legacy query path or the new query path. And this allowed, uh, this allowed them to gain confidence with the infrastructure and allowed us to learn, allowed us to tease out issues with functionality and performance without actually having to deal with issues in, in, in production. The 12% here, and it's actually now closer to 16%, represents data sets that had our most critical data. These are the policies we had to get done this year. And so those are all done. Our goal is to get to 100% or as close as we can at the end of 2024. So that's a pretty ambitious goal, um, but we think we can do it. The rest of these results I sort of talked about before. And so in the end, I think we ended up in a good spot. So I'm really hoping that by sharing this information with you, you can learn a little bit from our journey and hopefully um, move a little bit faster uh, in your own organizations. So with that in mind, I'm gonna invite Arti up here to talk a little bit about the future. Thank you. Thank you, Jerry, for sharing your story, sharing your journey with us. Good evening, everyone. I hope all of you are having a good time at reInvent so far, both the sessions and the evening happy hours, right? So that was Amazon Andy's Data Lakes team. It's a very large scale environment indeed, and they have millions of uh, data sets, tables, and uh, exabytes of data. The PowerPoint slides cannot convey the big in big data. You agree with me, right? You know exactly what I mean. So they have built a very custom solution. They have built a custom catalog on top of Glue and a custom permissions model on top of Lake Formation. 
This is to answer their very specific business needs. Now, every organization, every business has unique business needs. You have your unique questions that you want to get answers from your data sets. But does everyone have the time and resources to go build an elaborate custom solution? Do you need to do that in the first place? Right? Do you need to reinvent the wheel every time? So that's where the AWS managed services and its features come into play. You can start building a solution, a prototype quickly using the existing feature sets, uh, which let you uh, start playing with them immediately. You can test them on your actual business data set itself. You can study them for scale, performance, metrics, observability, and uh, quickly deploy them in production and see how uh, it grows and how it adapts. So I'm going to show you a demo here. And uh, using uh, AWS managed uh, feature sets from Glue and Lake Formation, and uh, we have built this from scratch, this uh, data curation pipeline. And within minutes and hours, we have built this. Let's see how it works. I have to log in. Just give me a second. OK. Let's start with the Redshift cluster. Because businesses gather usually a lot of data, your customer data, right? You're uh, gathering how your customers interact with your business, your services, and products. So you have, over a period of time, you are usually typically gathering these data sets in your warehouse, and you want to process them later at some point for uh, deriving business insights uh, from this. So we'll start with this Redshift cluster. And uh, typically, uh, it's just any other Redshift cluster and uh, a small uh, demo cluster for us. And uh, I've taken a customer uh, data set, which is um, uh, having very specific customer information. Um, this is just like any other uh, data set that you gather, and it has a, a 30 million rows. And when you see the uh, columns, you have customer or your user-specific information, like um, name, uh, uh, email address, uh, birthday information, uh, country, whatever you are gathering from for your data sets. And uh, we also, uh, let's explore some of these. And we see that uh, this is actually a synthetic data set. Um, typically, it has some transaction IDs. And the email address that you see here, this is uh, artificially generated. So it's, it's nothing uh, uh, confidential information. It's for demo purpose. So we're going to take this data set in Redshift. And we are going to see how we are able to curate this further by building a seamless pipeline. So here. Mahesh talked about choosing the right tools and uh, creating a data-driven culture, right? You want to ensure that when you're deciding your decisions, making decisions from your data sets, you want that data set to be valid, meaningful, and have accurate data, right? So Glue's data quality feature provides that functionality. It's fondly called DQ. It has pre-built templates. You can drag and drop in Visual Studio. That's what we are going to do here. So here, we are going to point directly on the Redshift cluster by creating a connection in Glue. We are not making copies of that Redshift data into S3. And we are going to directly point and run our um, uh, transformation. So this is like a drag and drop from the existing templates. Visual Studio allows you to do that. We are pointing directly and for the into the Redshift cluster data. You can, uh, for the transformation, we are going to run data quality test on it. So here for our example, I have chosen if a particular column is a primary key, column length is of certain characters, and there are no null values. And on the left side, 
you can see that from the, you have a list of uh, pre-built choices. You can choose and say what type of uh, uh, data quality test you want to run on your data sets in the table. And uh, just drag and drop, and uh, you have a variety of options here. You can also customize it, run your own you know, custom SQL, and uh, check for data freshness and all those stuff. And as a result of this uh, data quality test, what do you want to do? In, so you can either choose to have the take the results as is and uh, write it to S3. In Glue Visual Studio, I have taken a filter, again drag and drop box. I am choosing only the rows from the table which have passed the data quality checks, okay? And then writing them into my data lake in S3. So essentially, we have curated one step and directly pointing at Redshift cluster data, we are doing some data quality tests on it using Glue ETL and bringing only the valid, true, accurate data sets into my S3 data lake. And you can also click on the script button and further customize it and write your own custom code on top of it and do whatever manipulations you want. Okay, let's save this and uh, Let's uh, run it and give it some time to uh, finish. So we have done two steps here, as I said. Uh, we have uh, curated the data by directly pointing at a uh, redshift cluster, 30 million rows. We allow it to run. And we have crawled it using a glue crawler on the resulting S3 data set. And I've created the table in um, uh, Glue's uh, catalog. And uh, let's review the column information in uh, Glue. So Glue's data quality DQ adds three extra columns uh, to your table as a result of your uh, transformation, data quality checks. And we have filtered the rows based on this column, data quality evaluation result. Only the, the rows that pass those uh, data quality tests um, uh, we have brought into our data lake. So we had 30 million rows. Let's explore that table in Athena. We see that we have got only 28 million uh, rows. So that's, that's uh, you further, any downstream applications consuming this uh, data set, you have ensured that it's accurate data. There is no, nothing null and valid uh, data set. So all your downstream applications are going to process and make the right decisions for you. And you see that we have uh, taken only the rows that have passed all the data quality checks that we have added. And uh, yeah, so this is one step of curation and we were able to do it directly without making copies. Okay, in the next step, you're thinking about these uh, regulatory standards and compliances for data protection. You want to ensure that your data is accessed only on an as uh, need to know basis, right? In our customer example also, we saw that you want to share the data with just one copy, and, uh, and uh, you want to be able to um, go detect all the sensitive information, classify them into uh, sensitive or not sensitive, and share one, one copy of the data to the rest of your data users. For that, let's see, Glue's data sensitive, uh, sensitive data detection feature provides you that functionality. Let's again, uh, Go ahead, in Glue's Visual Studio, I have used boxes, drag and drop these boxes. Now we are pointing at the catalog table that we crawled, which is the result of the uh, DQ uh, data set. And we are, uh, this allows you the data sensitive data detection uh, is again a pre-built uh, feature. You can go and uh, choose from a list of choices. You can choose what is the sensitive data that you want to detect. You can choose the sampling size, and the threshold uh, where you want to say, hey, I want to qualify this as a sensitive data set. In our data set, we saw some personal names were there, first name, last name, and then we had some email address. And uh, for our uh, demo, I added US phone numbers and driving license. You can also have credit card numbers, SSN, all that. So these are all pre-built checks which will qualify as uh, sensitive data uh, for your uh, data sets, okay? And, uh, the last uh, point, what do you want to do with this uh, uh, data set that you are cl uh, classifying as, you know, detecting as sensitive and not sensitive, right? So here I have returned a custom uh, transform 
to see what to do with the output of that data. Let's take a pause here. You have a variety of uh, roles, especially data roles are coming up in organizations. There are data scientists who want to just play with and explore the data sets. They want to build their machine learning models. They don't need to have access to all of the PII data in your data sets, right? And then you have um, data analyst roles. They are exploring the data, building uh, dashboards, creating reports. They may need access to some PII data, not all of it. Again, we have some data engineering roles. These roles, they are writing scripts for uh, applications to consume that data. So probably they need access to the full table. They may need their applications or processing the data fully and storing it in an optimized way or doing something else, right? So you have a variety of data user wanting to use the same table of data. So you want to be able to do that and have one source of truth, but able to share it to different users with different data restrictions. Same, no copies. Lake formation allows you to do that. So here, as an output of that Blue's sensitive data detection, what we are showing you here is add lake formation tags to the scanned columns of the table, and uh, you add the tags to classify them as whether this column has the sensitive data or not sensitive data. Again, you click on the script version of the same uh, drag and drop box. You can go and customize and add further code and classify it and do whatever uh, output action that you want. That is exactly what I am showing you here. So here I am classifying and uh, adding the lake formation tags to that table and classify them into this column is sensitive or not sensitive. So at the column level, we are able to uh, do the tagging and uh, lake formation, um, I'll show you. I'll save this and run. And wait for it to finish. We'll see the, uh, inspect the output and see how the resulting uh, uh, tags uh, take effect on the uh, tables in lake formation. And then we'll query it further. So here is, uh, you see these uh, table in lake formation. In lake formation, you are able to see what's the tags on the database, table, and individual columns. Okay, we have taken the table, and now you will see that the tags added are, I have created it uh, previously, the classification tag into sensitive and not sensitive. Now you see that there will be few columns here that will have uh, sensitive and not sensitive information. We will query them you, in Athena, and I'll show you the difference on how this sees. So here, I have created two roles to, for our demo purpose, data analyst role and uh, data engineer role. The data engineer will be using an ETL role. Two IAM roles, referring to two different users. In Lake Formation, I have already created a, a permissions a policy to access those resources which have these tags. So let's see. The data analyst can access, the data analyst can access only the not sensitive columns. So the data analyst can use all the resources which does not have any sensitive information. And when you see um, in the data engineer's ETL role, they have access to the full table, meaning they have access to all the resources with lake formation tags, classification equals sensitive and not sensitive meaning they have access to all the resources which are tagged this way. So they can access all the entire table. I have logged in as data analyst now, and you can see that when the analyst queries the table, or sees the table even in the uh, Glue database or in the Lake Formation catalog, they are not going to see those three columns which were detected as sensitive, the uh, first, first name, last name, and we had the email address. Uh, in this particular data set, we did not have um, any other uh, confidential information like a phone number or anything, okay? So let's see, run the query in uh, Athena also and uh, see what the data analyst will see. 
so he is saying all the uh, quality results that uh, passed uh, the data quality checks. And uh, when you see that, all the other columns are visible. And this is the particular view for, of the table for the data analyst. So they don't have the visibility into those three columns. So what happens if we go, because we know what the name of those columns are, let's query and see what happens. So the column doesn't exist for that user. So the data analyst view of the table is completely restricted. He doesn't even see the information or the columns that's not accessible to him. Let's log in as the data engineer's ETL role and explore the same table. So understand that there's only one data set and we have created permissions and shared using lake formation to different roles with a restricted way. The engineers on ETL role, they'll see the full table with all the column access. So lake formation lets you uh, share the same data set to different users at column level, row level, and uh, cell level. So you have very fine-grained access control using lake formation. And it's, it's a, a regular full table for the engineer's role. That's, uh, that's the key here. He sees the email address, the first name, last name, et cetera. able to shift the view. I need uh, help here. Uh, AV team, I need help to switch to the PowerPoint view. Sorry, yeah. So this is the architecture diagram showing the demo components. So using uh, Glue's uh, features, you can uh, curate not only the Redshift cluster data, you can curate the Redshift serverless, you can point and uh, you can point at your uh, data sources residing in uh, on-prem servers, DynamoDB, DocumentDB, OpenSearch, et cetera, et cetera, and also third-party uh, data sources. Now, the data curation picture is incomplete without proper mechanism for data discovery. You want to be able to connect your people to the, and provide them the right data sets and also provide them the tools to analyze that data right away. All with ease, right? And you do not want to go through this process again and again. Whenever a new data set comes up or whenever a new team is created, right? You want to be able to think through this process once and make sure that you are connecting your people, data, and provide them the tools right away. Amazon Data Zone provides you that functionality. It's a fully managed data management service. It enables automated data discovery using advanced machine learning features and uh, enrich your data sets, which is the technical uh, metadata catalog into business uh, catalog uh, with the, uh, the Gen AI feature, um, uh, which was launched yesterday. Uh, your data sets are have able to give you a lot more descriptions so that your data users are able to easily find them using search terms that they use in their day-to-day -day life, right? So you're connecting uh, your data sources to the, your data users in a, produce, in a publisher subscriber model so the data user goes and searches for the data using simple terms and uh, requests access to the data. The publisher sees and uh, who is accessing the data, able to understand the need for access to that role, and uh, they are able to then grant access. Once the user gets access to the data, they are immediately able to explore the data using the tools that they are allocated with that data set. So that is the data zones project where you uh, connect your 
people, data, and the tools together in one place with ease. It speeds up collaboration between team members to explore uh, your data sets much quickly, effectively, speeds up your business decision process. All within the premises of strong data governance with lay formation permissions underneath. I uh, encourage audience here to go and explore Amazon Data Zone uh, in other reInvent sessions. With that, uh, we're at the end of our session. So we discussed what are the challenges in curating data at scale in a large organization, and some possible ways to think of solution. We saw how the Amazon.com uh, data lakes team has curated their data lake. Using the latest features of uh, AWS managed services like Glue, Lake Formation, and DataZone, you can curate and build your pipelines, data pipelines, much more seamlessly, effectively, in hours to minutes time. So, and you're able to, end of the day, you're able to share the right data with the right people and help your business processes. So, happy curating data. And uh, thank you so much for your time and attention this evening. Uh, these are some informational slides here if you want to take a uh, picture of it. And please help to fill the session survey. It helps us to deliver better and better sessions every year. So thank you again for coming. We'll open the floor for